So I will go ahead and invite our workshop panelists for this session. Dr. Taylor Stone is a research fellow at the Institute of Science and Ethics, University of Bann. Originally from Canada, he studied architecture and worked in the environmental nonprofit sector before completing his PhD in ethics of technology at TU Delft. He, his research focuses on the ethics of urban lighting and what it means to value and ultimately design for darkness. Taylor's writing has appeared in a variety of academic journals, and in 2019, he received the award for research from the Professional Lighting Design Committee, PLDC. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Taylor and go ahead and show us what you have for us. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome. I hope your uh, uh, Dark Side Conference is going well so far. And good morning or good afternoon or good evening or whatever it is uh, for you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen, <clears throat> excuse me, in a second uh, and present for a bit. Um, but if the group, uh, let's see, I see people are still trickling in and uh, I'm guessing that will happen for the next few minutes. Um, but it, 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 if the, the idea with this too is to, I'll present some ideas I have and then to leave some time at the end for discussion, reflection, to hear some of your thoughts. Um, and especially if the group stays a bit smaller, uh, hopefully we can uh, leave some time at the end and have a nice uh, conversation because I'm quite curious to hear uh, uh, from some of you. Uh, but let me share my screen and open it. And just a thumbs up, everyone can now see my uh, slideshow. Great, and can still hear me, great. Uh, yeah, so yeah, again, thanks for the introduction. So my name's uh, Taylor. Um, and uh, yeah, what I want to do in this workshop and discussion is talk a bit about art and specifically visual art and its relationship to ethics and philosophy and the role this can have uh, in uh, the dark sky movement. <clears throat> um, oop, it's going around, but uh, yeah, just uh, as a way into this uh, topic, um, I wanted to uh, discuss something that's been a little bit on my mind and probably anyone who's read the news in the last two weeks and seeing stuff coming out of the COPE conference in, in Scotland has been thinking a little bit about these bigger issues of climate change and everything associated with it uh, and these very complex political ethical discussions that are going on right now <clears throat> and I guess are still continuing uh, this morning last I read. Um, but it also reminded me of this now very famous photo uh, from 1968, Earthrise, which I think everyone uh, in this room probably is uh, aware of, right? Um, and this sort of this idea that this first photo that was taken uh, of Earth, of Spaceship Earth, or however you want to call it, um, and the sort of um, cultural environmental awareness that came along with it. Uh, which I think this quote really nicely captures this idea that the complexity and fragility of our lives is no longer just a concept, but it can be understood uh, personally. Uh, and the, so this idea in, in these sort of, uh, in, in the time in which it came out, uh, and the idea that this, 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 this photograph is quite powerful, inspirational, awe-inspiring, right? And perhaps communicated something that you could do in a scientific paper and a bunch of graphs and a long book, but somehow in this picture, it captured a lot of these ideas in a very powerful and inspirational way for things like the environmental movement. Um, and so what I wanna do in this, uh, in this workshop and in this talk is discuss a little bit about what the role of art and specifically here visual art, although I'll talk a little bit about design concepts and design prototypes at the end, uh, but specifically visual art and its role in something like uh, the dark sky movement and the preservation of the night sky. And really think through a few ideas. One is this idea of what it means to bring philosophy to life. So what it means to bring these complex ethical political discussions and ideas of, uh, you know, sort of surface these values of darkness and illumination through artwork um, and also what it can do for our moral imagination so how it can help us to actually imagine uh, what our future nights should and could look like um, and also just a quick disclaimer I'm going to show a lot of uh, artwork that I find uh, inspiring uh, and, and, uh, and quite cool uh, it is not my artwork so please know this is a lot of this is copyrighted material so please if you're going to 
distribute it, reuse it uh, to please get in touch with uh, the artists themselves before doing anything like that. Um, yeah, but first also a little bit to step back and, and to give a bit of my own uh, motivations. So as Ashley said, I work um, in uh, ethics and philosophy of, of technology, but also environmental ethics. I work at an ethics institute uh, in Germany. Uh, so when I tell people, <clears throat> excuse me, that I do uh, the ethics of nighttime lighting, I assume usually there's some sort of picture like this that comes into their mind. These debates, uh, we're wearing togas, walking around the halls, uh, pontificating. Uh, there's some truth to that. If you go to a philosophy conference, uh, I'll admit. Uh, but uh, the way I like to think about it, oop, my screen's a bit jumping around, uh, is a little bit more uh, like this. Um, you know, when we work in ethics uh, and applied ethics, a lot of this is questions about why. So why is something right or wrong, good or bad? And more generally, this question of what values, in a moral sense, what moral, social, environmental values are guiding our actions, our goals, our decisions, our policies, our designs, or otherwise. Um, and why? Why do I think this is important? Uh, and something I'll discuss. Uh, so why this sort of philosophical perspective? Um, uh, and, and what can it contribute to these sort of po policy discussions, technical papers, and so on around the dark sky preservation. Um, well, it's this idea that, you know, we can't necessarily just perceive and experience our actual light without also seeing the symbolism of light uh, when we see it, when we experience it. And I'll get into this, but I think any discussion that's been had about something like safety at night, you quickly see the, the blurring of, of literal functions and symbolism and meaning underlying our light. Uh, and the same goes for darkness. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a lot of power and possibility to, to sort of explore these philosophical issues through art and to look at the meanings and how we think about uh, lighting and darkness, which is something <laughs> I want to do with you uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, or however much time we have uh, at the end. Um, and to get some of your thoughts, as I said, as I said in, re in reflections, either on some of this work I've done or some of the questions I have uh, at the end. Um, so this is a little bit of background. Uh, now what I'd like to do is actually get into um, some art as well. Um, I see there might be some things in the chat. Oh, oh someone just said, okay, thanks. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll, any, yeah, again, if you have questions, feel free to post, but I probably I'll, I'll look at them at the end. Maybe actually, if there's anything that goes wrong technically, if people, just, you know, they can't hear me anymore, just, uh, I can see you on the side, so just wave at me and uh, I'll pay attention. Um, but yeah, to, to start and start thinking about, okay, we were talking about philosophy, values, the role that art can play in bringing these to the surface. Um, so I wanted to start then with, uh, this, this idea that I think anyone who's sort of experienced the dark sky and been out and seen it, I think uh, can relate to this idea of the sublime and, the, and this sort of the, the starry night sky as this paradigmatic uh, experience, right? And this aesthetic experience that brings home this idea that we can't put ourselves over and above nature, the sort of vastness of it and the sort of awe that it inspires. I think anytime you talk to people who are in this, this area, I think you hear these same sort of stories um, and for good reason. And uh, some artwork that I think captures this quite well. And I think maybe some people will be familiar, especially anyone who's up very early from uh, the United States is this uh, fantastic uh, poster series by uh, Dr. Tyler. Nordgren about the national parks uh, and this idea that half the park happens after dark. Um, yeah, I think it's a really cool, really uh, amazing photo series um, or poster series, I should say, that really captures some of these ideas of the sublime, right? This awe, this wonder, the sort of the beauty of, of these spaces at night, trying to bring home what exactly is it that we're trying to protect, protect and what are these experiences? Um, also a little bit of serenity is sort of a sense of place as well uh, that comes with these and the sort of slight changes that, that, that he brings to bring in the, the sort of the characteristics of the sky and the, and the different uh, national parks. Um, and uh, here we go. And um, yeah, inspiring enough that I think uh, maybe many of you again have read this book. If not, I would say it's sort of a uh, 
required reading so that's your homework um but this uh, amazing book and the the cover art for it as well right uh, that the uses this art i think again a testament to the power that that this artwork uh, helps to communicate about these experiences of the night sky that we're we're trying to to preserve and pr protect and promote as well um but so this idea of the sublime the night sky i want to put a bookmark in this and come back to it and then uh spend a bit of time uh looking at something else and going back into our cities, uh, actually in our cities at night and, and trying to appreciate that when we start to talk about values and value tensions and trade-offs, we have this thing, this beauty of the night sky, but this isn't the only perspective about night and darkness uh, that we should be discussing and thinking about uh, when looking at things like the protection of the night sky. Um, and even just starting with the, these sort of ideas that you can find in a lot of history of, of lighting, but I think this sort of nicely poetically captures it that a lot of the views and discussions of cities at night has been one of how to light them and how to increase the light historically and even today for various reasons. Um, and when you start to look at the history and, and you sort of can see how it's been captured in a lot of the, the sort of artwork and paintings, uh, you see a very different sort of uh, experience of the night than perhaps the, the Milky Way poster series give, right? Of, of sort of a time that's dangerous, there's fear, there's, there's evil, whether it's supernatural or other people uh, on the street. Um, and so it's not, it's, you know, the, the, the perceptions of nights and city historically, um, I mean, there are varied perceptions, but haven't always been, let's say, so uh, a positive, um, which leads to these, these other values and these competing values, things like safety and security and, and this idea of public order and policing uh, at night as these sort of values and goals that have been closely associated with uh, electric lighting. Um, uh, and this sort of idea of pushing darkness back because of what it represented. Um, but there's also been a lot of uh, positive views in, in, in sort of uh, looking at the electric light itself, right? There, there's also ideas by this historian of technology named David Nye. He talks about the technological sublime or the electrical sublime, that there is this, you know, this view of the city skyline has become this paradigmatic um, image uh, of modern times. Um, but also other values like nightlife and going out, uh, which we see captured here, and also more abstract values like progress and modernity that have been very closely tied with electric lighting. Um, which, though in more um, contemporary times as well, um, despite th these sort of ideas and these value trade-offs and tensions, there's also sort of uh, with the ubiquity, there's sort of an ambivalence as well um that, that's come along with lighting as it's been so proliferated in, in so much of the world and sort of faded into the background of our experiences again this historian uh, david nye talks about how now for a lot of us um we sort of see it as somehow natural right we, we've become so used to living in these these brightly overlit cities that we don't notice it anymore we take this to be the way things are let's say Um, and uh, yeah, and so, um, but to, I think what's important then, and, and again, in thinking through what we're talking about in this conference and also thinking through, yeah, these the sort of ethical and political questions is to bring then um, this infrastructure and this technology back into the spotlight. And ask how, again, art can help with this in, in looking at the contemporary uh, questions that we're facing. Um, and again, uh, I'm, I'm bringing a lot of these quotes. Some of them are a bit long, I apologize, but uh, don't worry, then there's a lot of pictures after. But uh, yeah, th I think this, this is one of the uh, first books I had read actually about uh, electric light cities at night. And I think this quote is really amazing and really poetically captures this idea as I was just discussing that we take for granted this infrastructure is just being a given, but we forget, and we see it as so as so permanent, monumental, uh, that we forget that this is this is the sort of anomaly where we're in. This has only been possible for a few generations, right? And it's good to to remind ourselves of that and remind ourselves that this is this giant infrastructure that we should be paying attention to. 
Um, and you know you can see it from for, again to to take this sort of uh, view from space, right? You can see it with with some of these amazing pictures uh, or composite images that the NASA's put out, uh, you know, and talking about the black marble and not just the blue marble uh, of of Earth, um, which we can see in these. Um, you can also sort of start to get a sense from the you know more and more of the satellite imagery that comes out, not just for scientific studies and analyses, but also just to get a sense of the scale uh, of, of the impact of our cities and, and the footprint they have at night. Um, but we can also make it a little bit more personal. And just to share sort of one uh, sort of story that leads to some art uh, that I, I find also very uh, useful and, and interesting and inspiring in a sense of, of leading to value tensions is, um, project that I've had the privilege to work on with some lighting designers as well as local stakeholders uh, on and off for the past uh, year or so uh, is, is developing a lighting plan for a, a park in, in the Netherlands uh, near uh, Delft and to Delft where I uh, previously worked um, and yeah it's sort of a, it's a mixed use recreational space we're looking at trying how we can sort of improve uh, the lighting along pathways while also preserving the, the inner dark spaces of the park. Um, but when we're looking at this, one of the, the issues that uh, has come up again and again is how dark we can actually make this space because of its, its context. One, it's surrounded by, um, I don't know, oh, can we see this? Yes, one, okay, so I don't know how it's moving on yours. Mine is a bit slow, the, the image is moving. But when it's, um, yeah, it's surrounded by big cities, by Rotterdam and The Hague, uh, but also looking at the industry that's surrounding it, right? So there's a lot of greenhouses this is, which uh, contribute to making this area one of the brightest areas uh, in Europe, uh, in Southern Holland, because of this industry that's been that's here, um, which we can see from above, but we can also appreciate when you go into this space. Um, but again, you know, when, we've, when you first start and look at this, you, you see it as, yeah, this is something, this is a problem. Um, but I also came across and was introduced to this amazing photo series, which I think also helps to bring out a bit of the complexity of this, this problem and this question, uh, as well as just drawing attention to the impact uh, of this industry on our, on our world at night. Um, so this is by a, a German uh, aerial photographer named Tom Hagen. And he, uh, yeah, so he does these air really cool aerial uh, photographs of different places on earth that we don't normally have access to with the intention of really trying to, to show the impact we have um, on our world. Uh, and he did this really cool photo series of the greenhouses in the Netherlands and showing just their sort of impact at night and what it, and what it really looks like from above. And um, yeah, and I mean, you know, you can see this light pollution. I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, for me, it also inspired me to look a bit more closely at this, you know, and it's a really, uh, it becomes a complicated issue, right? These, these, these images, of course, are quite beautiful. They're also a bit haunting for people who are dark sky advocates, maybe a bit uh, sad or something, but, but still quite uh, powerful images, I think. And, and but inspire you to think a little bit about these greenhouses, I think, because, you know, you might not know, but the Netherlands, very small country, uh, it's the number two exporter of produce in the world because of this, uh, the efficiency and, and the actual the efficiency of land use that they've created through the use of greenhouses, um, their food production, uh, they've been able to do this at a sort of unprecedented scale. Um, so yeah, so land use is great. Um, of course, there are other issues that they're still working on in terms of energy usage um, and the use of pesticides and so on. But if we start thinking about, again, thinking about these this COPE discussions and these bigger issues of uh, food scarcity, protection of forests and so on, uh, what the future holds and, and if these sort of greenhouses are gonna be a part of it. And there are, of course, there's a lot of work going on in the Netherlands about trying to introduce new laws and policies to minimize uh, the light pollution at different times and having shading and so on. Uh, but there will, of course, be some effects. But what I think this, this photo series does, and I think this was the intention of Tom Hagen, was just to bring attention to it and to start asking about these different trade-offs uh, and where we want to fall on here 
and also maybe think a little bit too about our lifestyles and what are we growing in these um what what are the costs you know that we don't always pay attention to uh, of having uh, the access to these certain fruits and vegetables year round um, so i think uh, for me it makes it a little bit more complicated than just seeing it as a good or a bad uh these sort of greenhouses but sort of starting to ask uh, what and if, and if this is a future where we're going to see more and more of these sorts of experiments and means of production, what this means uh, for the future of our, of our world at night and our industrial spaces at night. Um, and what we can do from here is then sort of zoom in again a little bit on uh, lighting technology itself. And again, I work a lot in this area called ethics and philosophy of technology, where uh, a lot of people are concerned with, okay, what does it mean now to what, what, what effects have our technologies had uh, on us, on our lives, on our perceptions, on our experiences, on our behaviors? And again, I think this is very nicely uh, captured by this American philosopher uh, and political theorist, Langdon Winner, who, talk, who has this nice quote where he sort of says, you know, whether deliberately or not, uh, the choices we make for our technologies are gonna influence all these things that we work, communicate, travel, consume, and so on for a very long time. Uh, which is also, you know, captured, I think, in, in, in again, a more sort of a glib or, or otherwise way by this uh, fairly uh, famous quote or often paraphrased quote from Winston Churchill, but we shape our buildings uh, and then they shape us. And of course, it's good to remember that this isn't uh, a one and done. This, this continues, right? We sh and, and this can be applied to lighting. We shape our lighting and then it shapes us. And then we're left to uh, deal with the choices we previously made, as we all know. Uh, today uh, and make new choices, which in turn we'll have to respond to uh, with the next uh, generation. Um, and, and again, and, uh, uh, some illustrations that I really like and, and I think uh, sort of capture and, and at least bring this to the foreground is this, uh, this really cool uh, artwork uh, and illustrations that have been done by uh, Tang Yua Hung. I apologize for my pronunciation in advance. Um, but I think he does this in a really interesting, a, sort of a more playful, somewhat uh, humorous, unexpected way of, of reminding us that, you know, again, we see perhaps as light is a given, but uh, it is a technology and it is within our control. Um, we do make uh, conscious choices about how we light our cities, how we light the spaces we inhabit. And it's good to pay attention to this as well. And so it, it, it is a technology that, that, that uh, we can affect if we want. And for me, I think this, uh, this photo series really does a nice job of, uh, of highlighting this, or not photo series, but these, these illustrations. Um, and then again, to, to sort of build on this and to think a little bit about what it means to rethink and reimagine our nights and appreciate this infrastructure and that we have control over it. Um, and think a little bit about not just what artists are doing, although I'll come back in a second to at least one last uh, series by an artist, but also think a little bit about uh, lighting designers and what lighting designers are doing and thinking about this. Um, both practically, but also the sort of conceptual experiments they're doing, which you can see in a sense of sort of, you know, speculative design, futuristic art, however you want to describe it. But I mean, these are sort of meditations as well on what our future could look like, right? Um, there's something like this. This is a booklet for a competition where a bunch of uh, artists were enlightened designers uh, were asked to imagine the future 30 years from now and what our lighting should look like. There's a lot of really uh, far out sort of really cool ideas that are in there. Um, not a lot of just, you know, floodlights and streetlights, uh, but a lot more subtle uh, lighting, right? And, and a lot more uh, innovative lighting. Uh, some things that you could also see new ethical issues arising, you know, there's ideas of where you have your own light, you carry sort of night vision goggles, so we don't need streetlights anymore, or you have, you know, drones that fly around and follow you. And with all of these, of course, you can also then start to see, okay, then what? Okay, we've, we've brought back the night sky, but then what new ethical issues emerge around privacy, accessibility, inclusion, and so on. Um, you can see other, yeah, companies like Glowy that are starting to look at bioluminescence, uh, which haven't rolled out, but they've released a lot of these sort of conceptual ideas about what, if we you know, if we had bioluminescence as our source of lighting, what our cities could look like and what this would mean for uh, our nightscapes. 
um, and some artists and designers that are, uh, you know, have tried some pilot projects. So this is a, a bike path by Dan Rosegaard in a studio in, in the Netherlands near Eindhoven that was built to uh, celebrate the anniversary of, of Vincent van Gogh. And um, yeah, so it's not just sort of an innovative use of new sort of lighting technology, uh, but also brings in some heritage as well. It's meant to, to evoke the, the starry night sky painting. From Van Gogh in the in the path itself, and another uh, art uh, or design lighting design installation that just uh, opened, I believe, here in, in the Netherlands is uh, there's this big sculpture that's in the north uh, of the Netherlands in this area called the Wadden Sea, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, also, I think they want to turn into a dark sky uh, park or the whole thing. I think a few islands have already been. Um, but also, so it's 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 protected because it's called intertidal zone. So it ebbs and so there's uh, there's yeah the the tide comes in and it, could be, it it goes between beach and sand basically twice or three times uh, every twelve hours. There's this flow and so they have this new giant forty five ton sculpture that's there, uh, and the lighting designers are working on it. Atelier L E K. Uh, they decided to to use the lighting to sort of celebrate and create a sense of place. So first they tried to you know, minimize the, the detrimental effects because of the angle of the lighting, but also have the light mimic the, uh, the, 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 the tide as well. So when, the, when it's high tide to have it blue and then as it goes out to change it to sort of the uh, yellowish orange. Uh, so it mimics the, the flow of the tide and tries to create sort of a sense of place uh, and, and sort of environmental sense of place through uh, the lighting design itself. So not to try and push back necessarily the darkness or, or the environment, but to rather have it to bring attention to the space that you're in and the unique ecological features. Um, and I think this opens up interesting questions about what, yeah, how lighting can actually celebrate uh, places through the innovative use of new technologies. Um, and so to sort of come back then uh, to think through and again to think go back to uh, the poster series at the start and the sort of starry night sky and, and this idea of the sublime is something out there but also thinking about these different values and tensions and trade-offs in our cities and in our industrial spaces to then really think through again how art can help us think about what sort of future we want. And again, maybe I like this quote too, that we can't necessarily predict it, but through our policy design choices, we constantly are inventing our futures. So this question of what future we want to invent for our world uh, after dark. Um, and I, this is one of my favorite series. Maybe some people are familiar with it by the French uh, artist, Terry Cohen. Uh, it's called the Darkened City series. It's uh, been out for a few years, but still ongoing. There's more uh, photos he's working on now, as I understand. Uh, Super cool. Uh, so what he did uh, was he went around the world, took photos of, of, of major cities uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and then he went somewhere at approximately the same latitude on Earth, uh, where there was a more or less unpolluted night sky and, and took photos there and then superimposed the photos onto the city. So the idea uh, is that, you know, if all the lights went out in Chicago or Rio or Tokyo, or Shanghai or otherwise, this is in principle, something like what the night sky would look like in these cities. Um, I think these photos are amazing. Again, they're beautiful, sublime, also a little bit haunting because the other thing he did was he removed all evidence of uh, people. Uh, so it's a bit odd to see a, a highway here without any cars, to see downtown Amsterdam without any people, uh, no lights in New York City and so on, right? Um, but, uh, what it does super powerfully, I think, is that again, it reminds us that we see, you know, we have all this light pollution around us. We have such bright nights in our cities, uh, but the night sky isn't this isn't gone, right? It's just temporarily hidden behind all this light that we've created. It's still there, uh, and it's still we're still able to access it. And so, and I think he gives sort of this, you know, this is art. It doesn't have to be a, a prescriptive statement that this is how our city should look but it gives us uh, something on a spectrum to say, okay, if we have you know, our New York City as it is now or our Paris as it is now, and we have this other extreme, then where do we want to be here? 
how much can we and should we bring uh, these night skies back into our cities? And how can something like this art sort of powerfully communicate uh, what we have so quickly cut ourselves off from? And let us think through this sort of idea that maybe, you know, we, we can access it in these parks, but what would it mean to bring it back into our cities, into our daily lives? What sort of sense of place could this bring? What sort of experiences and new perspectives could this offer us if we were able to see this you know, in our cities? And, um, and just then to wrap up um, and to again, to think a bit broader, to summarize, sorry, I'm an academic. We always have a summary slide at the end. Uh, that's just sort of what we do. But uh, yeah, just so, so the idea here is to think about, okay, visual art, especially, but maybe art and media more generally photography is this tool to bring philosophy to life. So it's a powerful means to communicate the goals of dark sky movements, uh, but also surface these different values and value tensions of illumination and darkness, maybe better than, than or, or as a way to accompany some more technical political discussions as well, sort of bring to the surface and into sort of experience, you know, whether it's the, the beautiful night sky, whether it's something, uh, that's a bit more complex, like what to do about uh, greenhouses and food production and it's the sort of uh, unrecognized effects, right? But it can help make the, bring this uh, and make this a bit more personal and experiential. And with art and with design to help stimulate uh, our moral imagination, to think about what the futures we want uh, and what sort of cities we want in the future. Um, and so, yeah, just to end then, um, I would encourage all of you as you know, I assume many of you are sort of on the ground, you're, you're at the least interested in this, maybe you're working on uh, dark sky park or dark sky community certification, so on and so on, or adv advocacy work of some sort to really think then, one, what, what sort of power that this art can have and how it can be a tool uh, to help to communicate these, these ideas and these goals and these questions but also to sort of turn the table and think, okay, if you are working on some space that you have this, this deep connection with, uh, what sort of art, what sort of media uh, could help you uh, to communicate the importance of that place, the power of that place, uh, and, and what you're trying to preserve, promote or protect there. Um, and so with that, I would say, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm looking forward if anyone wants to sort of reflect as well, bring up any other ideas they have, reflections about values they have with the art, any questions for me. And more generally, uh, always happy to talk about dark skies, lighting as well. Uh, feel free to get in touch. So thanks. All right, well, that was a really interesting presentation, Taylor. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And yeah, let's open the floor. If you want to raise your hand to start a conversation or if you just wanna unmute yourselves and ask a question, I would be really delighted to hear from you. Megan, hi. Hi. hi, yeah. Um, I'm Megan. I am a an advocate, and I live in London, in the UK. Um, and I, first of all, I really appreciate your uh, your your presentation, Taylor. It's something that I think about all the time, and the kind of like philosophy of darkness, and how you know it for us is is so much more than just about lighting. It's about a kind of there's almost a spiritual element to it. And and what you've said here about kind of visual elements of these things and art can really capture that. And I think it's particularly salient for people who are living in urban areas who may not have access to the night sky already or have some appreciation of the kind of um, the wonder of what that feeling is of experiencing the night sky. Why is it worth protecting? What, what is special about the night? Um, that this, this kind of visual art can really spark people's imagination. I saw recently, um, I think it was Visit Norway. And I mean, this is a really powerful marketing tool in general for like astrotourism or people who are looking to attract um, people to their parks. But, but I think it was Visit Norway that um, went around some big cities in Europe and was like basically showing people a picture of what, I think it might've been the, those um, 
the photos by the French artist Thierry, I forget his name, um, but people were amazed at what they weren't seeing, what was there that they that they couldn't see. Um, and it was kind of like, a, you know, come to Norway where you can see this. But I think that that message is very powerful. And it's something that those of us who are in urban areas um, should be thinking about and trying to use more because um, it's probably the, the quickest way to kind of get people's um, minds going in there and their imaginations going about what they're missing out on. Um, so yeah, just a comment and a, just a thank you because I really appreciate this presentation and, and it's, um, I think, discussing this underlying issue of why are we afraid of the dark? Where does that stem from historically, philosophically? That's a really critical part of dark sky advocacy that I'm not sure we've fully tapped into yet. And it's worth discussing it more and understanding it more and kind of thinking about it um, from the way of like, why do we feel this way about the dark? Why do we villainize the dark a lot of times? Um, and where does that come from historically or philosophically? So I really appreciate this, that's all. Ah, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I can reflect on your reflection, but uh, yeah, I think we're in agreement. But yeah, I think the I, I do feel, our, yeah, I can't necessarily replace some of these experiences you can have, um, but uh, can can be very powerful. And as you said, um, I think it's good to to consider, yeah, what it means for people who live in cities who might not have access. And you know, all indications are that the world is going to continue to urbanize on unprecedented scales. So more and more people are living in cities, more and more people are being born into cities. So can this be used as a way, yeah, maybe not to replace being being a, in a dark sky reserve, but to at least at least bring attention, right? That we don't just see light as the normal that we, that we live in, right? Um, and, and then start to question, yeah, what do we mean when we talk about safety? Um, what are the evaluations of perceptions we have? Yeah, but thanks. And I see someone uh, sharp has raised uh, her hand. Yes. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm MJ. Uh, I'm down in Cornwall in the UK on a year long project. And Megan, what you were just saying, it's so interesting because so my project is actually there are Bronze Age ruins here that are now understood to be night sky related or dark darkness, dusk, night related. Um, and so I'm a night photographer and I'm actually working on um, something a little different for me, which is installation, like creating an, an installation so that people can have this experience of prehistoric Bronze Age darkness. Um, and one of the interesting parts that I've had a ton of trouble <laughs> finding any resources on uh, is exactly what you brought up, which is, um, are, there scientific, are there scientific studies essentially of, pe of people's reactions to dark and night that aren't just larded with mythology? You know, cause what I'm trying to do is sort of zoom people back to a brainstem prehistoric experience and in, and in a way that's positive. And it's really tough to find, um, uh, I'm, I, I, and I was curious if anybody uh, here present has thoughts about that or resources, um, and also just in general with the with what I'm up to and in installation art and recreating darkness and the thought being shareware so that it could go. Maybe it starts in a museum as the prototype, but then it gets um, it's sharewared out to community centers and really populated overlit areas or, you know, and I can say, here's your image file. Here's the dimensions of the room. Here's how dark it needs to be. Here's the sound files. You know, here's how you run it. Um, anyway, but but that's uh, an, an arena that is surprisingly difficult to find resources about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see, I think Stephen is a... Yeah, hi there. Um, so I'm also in the UK uh, and I work in Planetaria, which is, is, is a really immersive uh, sort of audiovisual environment. I'm already working with, with several artists uh, on a project at the moment called uh, Curiosity and Creativity to bring art into Planetaria. Um, so I think there's lots of connections, um, certainly from, from Megan there and from, um, from you, M MJ, uh, just with regards to um, getting this type of stuff out to uh, to places around the UK. Uh, I have a mobile planetarium, so I do take it to dark skies as well. 
So there's, there's fixed planetaria, which are in the big cities where you can simulate the, the darkness. And then uh, there's mobile planetariums around the world, actually, that go out to remote rural communities and uh, take the sort of science stuff there. But for me, I really enjoy that sort of space between science and art. Uh, you know, we've worked with, we've, we worked with poets and artists and musicians um, within the planetary world. And um, yeah, so it's that's why I decided to come to this room rather than some of the other ones, just because I love that that intermix between, uh, between, between the disciplines. And, and obviously the, the philosophical views was really interesting there as well, Tyler. Um, yeah, it really, really got me thinking about different ways to, to engage with the public. Thanks. And I would say, I forgot to say at the end, but please, if you have anything you can share, if you, if this, you said, oh, there's this other artist, you know, I'm working on something as Stephen is, or I, this other artist, please send it to me. Uh, I'm trying to collect these. What I'm going to do with them, I'm not sure, but I, at, at the base, I just love and think it's a very powerful tool, but I think starting to collect and see these, the different work that the different artists and designers are doing uh, in one place. So please, if you have any cool stuff that you're doing or can think of, just send. Um, but to go back though, maybe, I don't know if there's another question or comment about uh, MJ's question. Yeah, you, you had asked about sort of research. I mean, if you send it, I, I can, uh, we can maybe discuss offline or th think about it, but I mean, I know there's some environmental psych psychology out there that looks at sort of feelings at night um, and these sort of the different sort of factors that contribute to people feeling unsafe, um, which of course things like gender is an issue, but also these different factors like entrapment um, and perspective and so on. So there is research that, that has been going on. Uh, you know, they're often, you know, you, these sort of psychology studies where they ask some university students to walk down the street and how do they feel, but still useful. Um, although sort of from a more philosophical, uh, critical perspective, though, I would say, I don't know, again, with something like safety, if you can just look at uh, the just look at some sort of you can get back to some sort of true experience without also thinking about our associations because they go back so far whether it's spiritual, religious, or otherwise, and how we think about illumination and darkness, that culturally to, 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 to uh, push those aside and to just have some sort of genuine experiences, I think is really difficult. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For all the reasons you just said, mm -hmm. I'm actually um, also, there's a, uh, I'm hooked into some brain science folks in the U.S., Mm. who study uh, like literally your 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 like neurological reaction to mm. color and to mm. dimness and to so that's actually my next stop but you're exactly right like what's an authentic experience mm. even that's the big question even before you try to replicate an authentic mm. experience yeah yeah indeed yeah I think my advice is sort of to, to as you might have noticed from my talk to sort of uh, steer into it and sort of appreciate and try and bring these values to the surface, right? So that they don't hold any power, as much power over us, right? Um, I think is another way to look at it, to, to sort of uh, embrace it in a sense, yeah. Um, but any, any other the questions or comments? I think we have a couple minutes left, Ashley. I'm yeah, <clears throat> I was just about to say, we have time for one more round of thoughts. But if not, I would say again to say, yeah, please, if you have any ideas, send it to me, any art things. I think Stephen posted some, his uh, website, which I'll copy down. Uh, thanks, but, but please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. As I said, I always uh, if you want to talk about philosophy and lighting and, and darkness. I uh, uh, j just send me an email. Uh, um, but if, oh. Taylor, could you, I'm just going to say, could you pop your email into the uh, chat? Just so yeah, absolutely. Let's see if I can get it right. I'm still, uh... And then if you could also drop your social medias too. Oh, um, I'm not such a social media person. <laughs> I'm not either. I, I uh, uh, admire people who can. <laughs> Yeah, I would say the best way to get in touch with me is via email. <laughs> yeah, apologies. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, otherwise, I'd say thanks, everyone, and enjoy uh, the rest of your uh, 
whatever's left on that the last uh, six seven hours of the 24 hours yeah um uh, i just yeah. put a link to the attendee package so our next session is north central and south america and that starts at 5 p.m utc so just a few hours um we have another round of presentations another round of workshop presentations and then after that we'll have a global close so if you are able to attend the last couple presentations it would be great um, as we said before, everything's recorded. So if you're not able to, you can always come back and watch anything that you have missed later. So um, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and close things off with that. Thank you again, Taylor, so much for your time and this engaging conversation. It really puts new perspective in not only the functional use of light, but how we connect with it and how we can really use it creatively to connect with our communities in a different way. So um, thank you for that different perspective. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. See you all in a few hours. <laughs>